Welcome to the program. We call this program the authentic early church. It is really necessary that we study the authentic early church because the Roman Catholic Church has the audacity to claim that it is the early church going back to the earliest times. And besides this, some Bible believers have scant or little knowledge of what are the facts of the early church. I'm privileged today to have with me Pastor Bill Mancaro, who is well known with biblical studies and historical research and studies. So I'm happy to have him. Welcome, Bill, to the program. Thank you, Richard. It is um, therefore important that we go back and see just where the early church started and what it was founded on. The early church started in Jerusalem and it was founded on the gospel message that as sinners before the all holy God an individual, be a man or a woman, is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ Jesus alone. It is Christ Jesus as he had proclaimed himself to be the anointed one of God. And it was, he proclaimed to be the son of the living God. It was on him that the church was based. He was the cornerstone the rock on which the church was based. And so the church was founded in the city of Jerusalem. We're told in the scriptures that the church which was at Jerusalem and they were scattered abroad in all the regions of Judea and Samaria. And so the early church went forward from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. Later on they spread, the believers spread and we had churches in Cyprus and in Antioch. And the, the believers in the first church back in Jerusalem heard that the people at Antioch had believed and they got Barnabas and wanted him to go and build them up in the faith, the true gospel of Christ Jesus. Barnabas went first of all to Tarsus so that he could find Paul of Tarsus, who has become the famous Apostle Paul. And he brought him and they spent a whole year instructing the believers there at Antioch. And it was there at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. The church then had this unifying factor that it was based on Christ Jesus. He was the cornerstone, he was the one that they believed on, and it was salvation by grace, and by, by grace alone and through faith alone, and in the person of Christ Jesus alone. And so we come to the whole concept of church to see what the early believers saw was the fact of what the church indeed was essentially in the way it was established and how they live this out. So I'd ask that you, Bill, explain this for us. Well, the, as you said, Richard, the unifying center of this assembly of believers uh, was not ritualism, was not a hierarchy, it was in fact the gospel. And so it's important that we know biblically just what church means in scripture. What is the concept of church? Uh, the Greek word ecclesia uh, literally means the called out ones. In the New Testament, it's applied to the whole company of believers of whom Christ said, I will build my church. The Apostle Paul's definition under the direction of the Holy Spirit is that the church is Christ's body. So most regularly, the word signifies the local assembly of believers. The expression, the church of God, was a collective idea, a, a group, uh, 
uh, a congregation of, of believers. As when the Apostle wrote, Give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the Church of God, meaning the believers, and that's as, as distinguished from the Jews and the Gentiles, the non-believers in Christ. The ordinary believers are continually called the church, as the apostle addressed them. Uh, and for example, he said, quote, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Uh, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, for example. See, the church was simply the community of believers. This is an important concept. Uh, the church is not a, a, an official structure, an organization. Uh, the, simply the community of believers. Uh, all the messages given by the Lord through the Apostle John, for example, in the book of Revelation, were to local churches. The central feature of the churches was the gospel of grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Uh, as, for example, expressed by the Apostle Paul, uh, in Ephesians, for it is by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, these local churches believed and taught the gospel of God's grace. That gospel for them was, in the words of Scripture, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Faith alone, and faith, of course, consistent with the Scriptures, was the means by which the believers entered into the salvation purchased by the perfect life and blood sacrifice of Christ Jesus. Across Middle East Asia and Europe, local churches were established as ordinary believers spread the gospel. Yes, it is important to see that local churches were established from Jerusalem and then in different parts of the world. And we have some historical record of some of the early leaders of these local churches and there is a quite well-known book that is fully documented and I want to quote from that some of the exact words from the early believers so that we know exactly what they said and I'm quoting from the quite well-known book called the Primitive Doctrine of Justification Investigated by George Stanley Faber. For example, we read in this book about Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp was born about the year 69 and he died a martyr in about uh, the year 155. He testifies about being saved through grace and Jesus Christ. His exact words were the following, quotation, The Lord Jesus Christ, in whom ye believe, knowing that through grace ye are saved, not from works, but by the will of God, through Jesus Christ. End of quotation from Polycarp. And then we had, quite well known to Clement of Rome, he died about the year 100. He wrote about being justified by faith. His exact words were the following, quotation, Therefore, we also being called through God's will in Christ Jesus are not justified through ourselves, neither through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works, but through faith end of quotation from Clement of Rome. Quite well known to is Justin Martyr who was born about the year 100 and died about the year 165. He wrote about being justified on account of faith. His exact words were the following quotation, it was not by reason of circumcision that Abraham was testified of God to be righteous, but on account of faith. For therefore, before he was circumcised, it was said of him, Abraham believed in God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. End of quotation from Justin Martyr. Irenaeus, well known as well, he died about the year 190, or maybe as late as 202. He clearly explains uh, 
the Apostle Paul's message in Romans chapter 3. Irenaeus wrote the following quotation, When Christ came he accomplished all things and still in the church continues to accomplish the New Testament foretold by the law even unto consummation. As also the Apostle Paul says in his epistle to the Romans, but now without the law the righteousness of God is manifested, being testified by the law and the prophets. For the just shall live by faith, but that the just shall live by faith had been foretold by the prophets. End of quotation from Irenaeus. The spread of the Christian faith during the first three centuries was very rapid, uh, very extensive. Uh, in the providence of God, there were several main reasons for this, uh, and some reasons we don't often, uh, often think of. Uh, one was, the, of course, the fidelity, uh, the zeal of the preachers of the gospel. Another was the heroic deaths of the martyrs. Now, you, the enemies of the church thought killing the Christians uh, would wipe out the church, weaken the church. In fact, it had the opposite effect, uh, and a saying came to be uh, very well known, uh, that the uh, blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, when the blood of the martyrs is spilled, uh, it produces strength and growth in the church, and that certainly was the case. Uh, another reason for the spread of the Christian faith, especially during the first three centuries, was the translation of the scriptures uh, into the languages of the Roman world. And uh, one that people often don't think of is the well-developed and expansive roadway system constructed under Roman authority under which the gospel was carried. Remember the Lord put uh, the, uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in a certain time and a certain place uh, and it was a perfect time for the spread of the gospel. With trade routes, with the Roman Empire being so well developed, uh, the gospel could spread all over the, the known world. Under Emperor Septimius Severus in 193 to 211, when he was ruling, uh, Christians suffered terribly. This is part of the blood of the martyrs being the seed of the church. Uh, the most severe persecution was under the Roman Emperor Diocletian. Uh, and his co-regent Galerius uh, during the years 303 to 311 AD. The historian Philip Schaff sa says, quote, all copies of the Bible were to be burned, it's under Diocletian and Galerius. All Christians were to be deprived of public office and civil rights. And last, all without exception were to sacrifice to the gods upon pain of death. So if you didn't, unquote, if you didn't sacrifice to the, to the pagan gods, you were to be killed, uh, and very painfully as well. But far from exterminating the Christians in the gospel, the persecution purified those who preached and increased their ability to give the gospel message. We now come to Vaudois, the early believers. Now some of the Vaudois had left Rome because of the persecution and they went to the Carthian Alps, which in modern terms is northern Italy and southern France and the, in the Alps, and they took up residence there. And these believers going back to apostolic times are really interesting because their faith was based on the scriptures and the scriptures alone. For them, it was the only rule of faith, the authority of the written word. Now we will later on document much more about the Vaudois, but uh, just a mention of them as a remarkable people who were the early church in uh, the northern part of Italy, going up into southern France and the Cartian Mountains. And then we had the group called the Paulinus. They go back at least to the 7th century, if not before, in what is now modern Turkey, and they suffered under the Byzantine persecution, uh, particularly under the Emperor Constantine Pogonatus, who issued a decree against them in the year 684 to persecute them. And the Paulinus refused 
to worship any icons or images of Christ or of the Father of the Holy Spirit. They refused this and they tenaciously held to justification by faith alone and grace alone and in Christ alone. And this is why they were called the Paulicians because it was after the doctrine and teaching of the Apostle Paul. Their faith spread into southern France in a group called their the Albigenses, they were really uh, Paulicians, the same faith as the Apostle Paul explains in Romans and in the other epistles, and they lived there in, um, in southern France, in and around the city that is there to the present day called Albi. Uh, they have remarkable history until, of course, they were persecuted by Rome under the horrendous decrees of uh, Innocent III many, many centuries later. But they had a really interesting life where their agriculture was so well developed and their churches so well established right across southern France. And they, they were an example of the um, Paulicians living in France with a different name but the same faith by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ Jesus alone. We even have the historian, quite well known, the secular historian, given writing in the well-known book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And he talks about the, the, Paul, the Paulicians. He says, the visible assemblies of the Paulicians of the uh, Albigois were extirpated by fire and sword. The bleeding remnant es escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity. The disciples of St. Paul, who protested against the tyranny of Rome and embraced the Bible as a rule of faith, and purified their creeds from all visions of Gnostic theology, end of quotation from Gibbon. The Paulicians held to an orthodox view of the Trinity and an orthodox biblical view of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. And so they were remarkable believers and we have seen different parts of the world where they spread the faith to and uh, we are really thankful for the early church as represented by the, by the Paulicians. Richard, earlier you mentioned the Vaudois, sometimes, of course, called the Waldenses, uh, in the Alps of, uh, of uh, southern France and northern Italy, uh, the valley people, um, protected in their valleys. Uh, the, uh, the, they take their name, uh, Waldenses, uh, after the name of one of their famous leaders, uh, Peter Waldo of Lyon. Uh, they were of ancient and truly apostolic origin. Uh, there, it is thought that they were able to maintain the ancient faith of the apostles of the early church because they were uh, in these valleys and hidden in, in, in an area that was, it was virtually inaccessible to those who did not know the territory. So it was very difficult uh, for uh, outsiders to influence them. Uh, so they maintained the original apostolic faith. Uh, the first distinguishing characteristic of the Vaudois or Waldenses was the authority and popular use of the Holy Scriptures. They anticipated the Reformation in that sense. Uh, the Bible, as many people know, was a, a closed book. It was the people were not allowed to have the Bible uh, in the, uh, uh, under Roman rule, particularly Roman church rule, uh, for many, many years. Uh, but the Waldenses had the Bible, and in this they anticipated, as I said, the Reformation. The Bible to them was a living book, as it surely is. And there were those among them who, believe it or not, could quote the entire book from memory. The second distinguishing characteristic of the Vaudois, or Waldenses, was their moral and orderly daily behavior in accordance with Scripture. They lived what they believed. The third characteristic was the importance of preaching and the rights of believing men to exercise the preaching function. Many centuries after the initial preachers in early post-apostolic times, uh, in the late 12th century, Peter Waldo and his associates were also preachers. 
to these fundamental characteristics that I've mentioned, the Waldenses, uh, based on the Sermon of the Mount, added the rejection of oaths, the condemnation into purgatory, the theory of purgatory, and prayers for the dead. They rejected those. Uh, they believe there are only two ways after death, the way to heaven and the way to hell, which is exactly what Scripture teaches. In 1487, Pope Innocent VIII's army invaded the valley of the Waldenses. And the Waldenses fled to a huge cave. Now, the Pope's armies fought the Waldenses for many, many, many years. Uh, but in particularly in 1487 was the most horrendous time. Uh, the Waldenses finally fled to a huge cave. The Pope's men piled up wood and brush at the entrance and set it on fire. Afterward, there were found over 3,000 people dead inside that cave, including 400 infants who were suffocated in their mother's arms. The Vaudois or Walden's, Waldensian movement touched many, many people throughout many centuries and attracted converts across Europe, commencing in post-apostolic times from what is now northern Italy and southern France. Now, the expansion of Christianity in Asia is also a very fascinating story. About this, Moffat writes, quote, Before the end of the first century, the Christian faith broke out across the borders of Rome into Asian Asia. Its roots may have been as far away as India or as near as Edessa in the tiny semi-independent principality of Osrone, just across the Euphrates. From Edessa, according to tradition, the faith spread to another small kingdom 300 miles further east across the Tigris River, the king of Adiabene, with its capital at Arbail, near ancient Nineveh. By the end of the second century, missionary expansion had carried the church as far east as Bactria, which is uh, what is now northern Afghanistan, and mass conversions of Huns and Turks in Central Asia were reported from the 5th century onward. So you see how the gospel spread tremendously. Uh, by the end of the 7th century, Persian missionaries had reached what they called the end of the world, the capital of the Tang Dynasty in China." Unquote. Yes, and that is most interesting, the spread of the faiths through Asia. And um, interesting also is the spread of the Christian faiths in uh, Northern Europe in Ireland. Ireland is a remarkable story of the early church and it goes back to one man in particular, Patrick. Patrick was born in Roman Britain, in what is now Scotland, in the year 373. His father was a deacon in the Bible-believing church and his grandfather had been a pastor. These facts are recorded in Patrick's own testimony of faith and we have historical record of the actual that this is a, an authentic document going back to Patrick himself. Patrick with associates, fellow evangelists, set out for Ireland in the year 405, in or about, that's nearly a precise date, and the work of the gospel was most difficult for Patrick and his associates. It was because paganism ruled in Ireland and it was the Druids, a false form of calling up spirits and mysticism and the evil religion of the Druids. As you go through Ireland to this day you can still see some fields where the Druids had been. It's, a, it's quite interesting. The Druids was a, it's a big part of Irish history, but this is what Patrick came against and he preached the gospel of God's grace that we are saved by the righteousness of Christ Jesus and faith in him and it's amazing how Patrick and his fellow evangelists spread the gospel for 60 years right across Ireland and uh, it's uh, also a known fact that just as the days of the, in the year there's 365 churches are reckoned to have been formed in 
Ireland, Andra Patrick and his associates, a remarkable story that is true historical fact that the gospel went forth and churches were founded right across Ireland, amazingly. And these were churches like biblical churches like Timothy and Titus had set up. These were where the assembly of believers was the church and there was an elder or a pastor not to lord it over the people but to help to teach and to make make sure that there was discipline and order in the church. Patrick was well known too for monasteries. Now these were not like monasteries that were set up after Patrick. Monasteries by the Catholic Church where people came aside to be more locked up and to be celibate and never to get married and all of this stuff that the Catholic Church did. These were monasteries where men came aside to study the scriptures and to know the gospel message and to be trained to be evangelists and to go forth where Patrick had come in with his associates and now they trained others to go forth to give the gospel message right across Ireland and so these were the monasteries later on these men for the most part got married settled down and had families of their own but they went aside in the monasteries to be trained in the scriptures and in the true gospel message and this is remarkable so much so that Ireland became known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars it's just, it just remarkable the history of Ireland and I say this with some joy because I'm an Irishman myself and this is the legacy of Ireland. It was not only the legacy of Patrick and his associates but it went on for 600 years after Patrick. That's a long, long time and where not only was the gospel message still maintained in Ireland and preached right across Ireland but missionaries went forth to other parts of the world and some of those were quite well known. I was in Scotland touring and preaching and teaching in Scotland in 2008 and it was interesting I was at one church called the Church of Columba. <laughs> he was a famous Irish missionary that went forth from Ireland to evangelize in Scotland in the year 563. Columba was quite well known and also was Columbanus. He set out to evangelize France and, uh, and Germany in 612 with, with other associates. He, he, he set out Columbanus. And then we had Killian, well known also. He set out with other brothers accompanied him to go to Franconia and Wasburg in 680. For Nanan and with 12 other brothers and the Lord set out to bring the gospel to Belgium in 970. Irish missionaries carried the gospel to different parts of the world. For example to Britain, Germany, France, uh, Switzerland, Italy and beyond. It is an amazing story of the early church in Ireland and then the early church in Ireland establishing churches in different parts of Europe. Well, Richard, that is certainly an amazing, amazing story. Uh, turning from Ireland and, and environs to the city of Rome. The history of the early believers in the city of Rome is very encouraging. The first pastors uh, and churches in Rome had a true and living faith uh, in God's grace through the gospel. They had a biblical faith. Uh, from the letter of Paul to the Romans, one sees that the gospel was faithfully treasured in those early Roman congregations. Uh, at the beginning of the letter, the epistle to the Romans, uh, Paul commends the believers at Rome for their faith. He says, quote, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Now such approvals are infrequent with the Apostle Paul, and yet he commends uh, the church at Rome for their faithfulness, uh, that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, as he says. Now the faith of the churches of Rome continued to be very well known and faithfully lived for 250 years, um, 250 years more, under very adverse 
conditions, uh, including extreme persecutions, as we know, uh, the most famous of which, of course, took place under Emperor Nero in 64 AD. And perhaps you've read of the horrible things that Nero did, of, uh, um, including taking Christians and, uh, and dousing them with uh, pitch and uh, while they're still alive and l sticking them on his garden wall and lighting them as human torches, living, um, of course, dying in agony uh, for his amusement. Totally unimaginable, though, for these early believers in Rome who stuck to the scriptures faithfully would be the present concept of the most holy Roman pontiff. Uh, unthinkable likewise would be the belief that rituals uh, could confer the grace of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the fellowship of believers, a top-heavy hierarchical system uh, from layperson to priest, from priest to bishop, bishop to cardinal, cardinal to pope, that would have been totally unthinkable, totally abhorrent uh, as being from the world and not from Christ. Christ who said, one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren through the Holy Spirit. The persecution of Christians in Rome, the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire, ended in 313. Uh, in fact, the, uh, both Western and Eastern. And that year the emperors, who were Constantine in the West, Licinius in the East, proclaimed the Edict of Milan. That decree established the policy of religious freedom for both paganism and Christianity. Uh, four vice prefects governed the Roman Empire under Constantine, and under his authority, the Christian world was to be governed from four great cities. Those cities were Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Rome. Uh, over each city was set a, a patriarch who governed the elders of, of his domain. That was later called a, a diocese. The mind of, the purpose of Constantine, was that the Christian churches were to be organized in a fashion similar to the government of the Roman Empire. And we see that today in Roman Catholicism. It's modeled on the Roman Empire system. Uh, and the respect enjoyed by the various Christian elders was in proportion to, usually, to the status of the city in which they resided. Uh, and there were big controversies about that and big fights among uh, the, the various bishops. And one would say, uh, well, I'm, I'm the bishop of, of Rome. I should have the preeminence, the seat of the Roman Empire. Uh, and the bishop of Jerusalem and said, well, who better to be the, the chief bishop than the bishop of Jerusalem where the church, uh, where the Lord started, uh, the Jesus Christ uh, was incarnate. Uh, so there were big, big fights about that, and Rome, as we know, eventually won. Since Rome was, from a worldly sense, the most powerful and prestigious city of the time, it was rationalized that the most prominent and influential bishop should be the bishop of Rome. So gradually that came to be the case. Uh, gradually, his, the honor and respect given to him grew. Uh, the Church of Rome, however, went into great decline. In the 4th and 5th centuries, the bishops of Rome then demanded to have more recognition for their exalted position. So they grew in influence and power as the Church uh, declined and fell more and more into uh, 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 pagan rituals and ceremonies and, and uh, such things. Also in the 4th and 5th centuries, as the gospel was watered down, its rightful place was taken by ritualism and ceremony. The true worship of God, the inner uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit gave way to external externalisms, formal rites, uh, idolatry. Pagan practices were also introduced, and they were whitewashed with an external form of Christianity, much as Christ uh, said the Pharisees, uh, you know, they, they, uh, these people uh, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Uh, they uh, uh, outwardly uh, have all the rites and the rituals down, uh, but as he said, you are like whitewashed sepulchers. Outside you appear pure, the inside you're full of rottenness. Uh, and that's what we had with, uh, with uh, the, on, the increasing influence of Rome and instituting these rituals in the place of the gospel. Uh, the clergy laity division of the church uh, became the accepted base. Uh, that further devolved into this hierarchy of the ruling clergy that I mentioned a few moments ago. By the end of the fifth century, a sacrificing priesthood was introduced in which the priest presumed to mediate between God 
and the believer. Uh, and that replaced the early ministers of the gospel who had simply taught the scripture. Uh, now, scripture s says no such thing, specifically says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But this was thrown out by Rome, it said, no, it's the priest, it's the mediator between God and man. The church was no more the fellowship of believers under Christ Jesus, united by the gospel, united by true worship, uh, united by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but rather it became an institution dominated by a hierarchy of bishops and, and elders. And simultaneously from the early to the mid-fifth century, the city of Rome was beset by invaders. Uh, first by Alaric the Goth, who captured it in the year 410 AD, but he didn't stay to rule. Next came Attila the Hun, who in 452 was persuaded by Leo, who was the bishop of Rome at the time, to stop his advance and leave Italy altogether. Finally, Genseric, leader of the Vandals, captured the city, but was persuaded by Leo, again, to spare the lives of the Romans. As a result, Leo's fame as Rome's protector grew enormously, and his power as the Bishop of Rome also grew enormously and developed into the Roman Pontiff being, for all intents and purposes, the successor to the Caesars of the Roman Empire. And that is really important to see how the barbaric invasions really played into the hand of Rome. And something else was really going to help Rome, and that was that the emperor moved from the city of Rome to Constantinople in the year 330. And this enormously helped the Pope now to take the place of, of the emperor or to, to attempt to get civil power besides the spiritual power that he claimed. We saw that the barbaric people were becoming converted and one of the well-known of these barbaric people was the Franks, Clovis, king of the Franks, uh, uh, the head of those people who were uh, invading Rome and coming to uh, take over was Clovis. And Clovis accepted the faith of the Roman Church. Not Christian faith, but the faith that was practiced in Rome. He had made a vow on the battlefield when he was defeating the Alemanni that he would be baptized if he won the battle. And so he was baptized and it was in the year 496 and the the Bishop of Rome gave him the title, the eldest son of the church. That was one of those uh, uh, famous uh, people who had converted to the faith of Rome. Others in the 6th century followed. The Burgundians of southern Gaul, the Visigoths of Spain, the Suevi of Portugal and the Anglo-Saxons of Britain followed suit and joined the religion of the city of Rome. They submitted to the beliefs that there was a bishop of Rome that they looked to and that a person is made right with God through rituals or what was later on to be called sacraments. And so this type of religion did not differ that much from the paganism with which they came, where people looked to an authority for their being somehow accepted with God, and they looked to rituals. So they believed in the rituals of Rome. And so we had tribes of people who had been pagans now being converted to the religion of the Roman Catholic church as it was initially, uh, with no gospel, belief in ceremonies, and belief in the position of the Pope, or the, the Bishop of Rome, he wasn't called the Pope at the time, but to be the head or the one who was controlling 
or managing the church. Now there was a, a decision from one of the emperors who had left, uh, the emperor left, we know, Constantine left, and one of the successors, well-known Justinian, in the 6th century made a decree, a formal decree in writing, that the Pope of Rome was to have civil authority in the city of Rome. He not only was to be recognized spiritually, but he was to have civil authority and he could rule in the city of Rome. And so the popes began to take up civil authority and began to use coercion for those who did not accept their spiritual rule or now their rule because Justinian had decreed in a quite well-known decree that the Bishop of Rome was to be recognized in this way. It became even more so later on as another emperor, Phocas, quite well known, who ruled from Constantinople from 602 to 610. He was at the same time as a man who became Pope in 607, Boniface III came along and Boniface wanted to be recognized by Phocas much more than Justinian had recognized the, the Bishop of Rome before. He wanted to be recognized in two ways in particular. He wanted to be recognized as the one who was seated where Peter had been seated in Rome as Bishop of Rome. Now this idea that Peter was Bishop of Rome is a tradition that he was trying to call upon, not even a very strong tradition because there's no mention whatsoever in Scripture of Peter ever being in Rome. Where he was is outlined in Scripture very clearly where Peter went to. No mention of Rome. When Paul was in Rome, writing from Rome, he never mentions Peter. Peter has never mentioned uh, ever even been in Rome, let alone Bishop of Rome. But Boniface III wanted to be recognized by Phocas, the emperor, as being in the place of Peter as Bishop of Rome. And then he wanted to be recognized officially in law as being the universal bishop with authority over other bishops in the known world at the time. And so it was that Phocas in a decree recognize these two claims by Boniface III and that the Roman Church has gone on from that time to still purport the lie that they are the church who is seated where Peter was seated on their uh, inane and even groundless tradition and uh, that their bishop is universal bishop having authority over other bishops. So this is where it really went back to Boniface III. And then the popes were to use this civil authority that they got from Justinian and later from Phocas to persecute and come against true believers. Crusades were sent out from papal Rome and that's a whole story in itself and then the Inquisition that started under the 3rd this went on for 605 years and Rome was to become well known for its persecution. It is reckoned by historians and it's by credible historians that up to 50 million people suffered, were tortured and put to death under the Inquisition. So this is uh, an amazing thing and we have documented that in a separate DVD and uh, it is fully recognized by reputable historians. So this is the amazing history of papal Rome, of bringing in horrendous persecution and trying to have people submit to them. It was a place in which 
the Roman Church grow in, grew in importance, but while they grew in importance in those early years, for 200 of these early years, it became an immoral, mostly an immoral, an immoral hierarchy with the Pope leading in immorality. There were 200 years of absolute debauchery and, and uh, wildness of living in the, in, in the very place where they claimed to be, in the place of Peter, and it was unbelievable history whereby some of the popes reigning in their teens and some of the immoral offspring of the popes being made cardinals and later on popes themselves. It was it's horrendous history, but this this went on for two hundred years until the eleventh century. In the eleventh century there was a quite famous pope. Gregory the Seventh. Gregory had been Hildebrand before he became Pope and he's still known as Hildebrand in many of the historical records. Hildebrand, Gregory the Seventh, set up to reform the church by discipline and to weed out immorality and to bring about a definite control over the lives of bishops and the Pope himself under Hildebrand or Gregory leading the way in discipline and in a really strict discipline type of living. So this is quite interesting but it was from that time Gregory the Seventh that a more deadly persecution came in and very subtly because from this time on the popes are going to claim to have civil authority over kings and princes where there they claim that the Church of Rome is not only the universal church but it has authority over civil authority powers and uh, it's amazing how many of the, uh, the, the kings and princes gave in and that was one of the reasons why the Inquisition succeeded is that uh, kings and princes obeyed what the popes said to them because they looked upon their kingdoms were subject to the kingdom that the Catholic Church claimed to have. So this is amazing turnaround with Hildebrand Gregory the VII brought in in the 11th century and things did not change whatsoever. They went from bad to worse right up to the 16th century. But in the 16th century we had the remarkable turnabout in what was called the Reformation. And I'd ask you, Bill, to explain the Reformation. Certainly, Richard. Uh, the Reformation in the 16th century restored the church to what it had been at its beginnings. That certainly was the, uh, was the uh, in, in obvious intent of the Lord uh, through God's providence. Uh, by What do we mean by reformation? Uh, simply the word reform, reforming the church back to what it originally was in apostolic times, reforming the church. Thus we get the word reformation, uh, Protestant reformation, uh, restoring the church to what back to its beginnings. Uh, the five biblical principles accepted uh, among the reformers were the key to this reforming restoration of the gospel of grace. These principles stated that in all matters of faith and morals, the final authority is the Bible and the Bible alone. Now be before the uh, before the all-holy uh, uh, situation, uh, uh, before the Holy God, rather, an individual is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. An individual is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, that is faith in Christ, through in Christ alone. Following on this, all glory and praise to God alone. Reforma the uh, the Reformation possessed definite characteristics, uh, many of which set it apart from any other revival in history. Uh, one of the distinguishing features was its territorial scope, uh, geographical scope. It began simultaneously and independently. That's what's there's without coordination, other than the coordination of the Lord Himself. 
uh, simultaneously and independently in various uh, European countries. Uh, the power that brought the Reformation into existence, uh, of course, and made its progress possible were the Holy Scriptures, uh, the Bible. The Greek New Testament, prepared by Erasmus, the great uh, humanist scholar, not humanist in the sense we think of today as an unbeliever, but uh, uh, the old sense of humanist scholar, uh, great scholar, Erasmus, uh, was a help to scholars all over Europe in learning the way of truth and life. And after the Reformation once got underway, uh, there became a great friendship and a great cooperation and fraternization among the reformers in the various nations. Uh, the Reformation spread with tremendous rapidity, uh, bringing with it a complete change in thought and conduct. Uh, and that, that's one, one of the amazing events of history. Uh, the invention of movable type uh, coincided uh, with all of this. So the Lord brought all of these things together. Again, much as, as he had done in the early church with the Roman Empire, we talked about with the trade routes and the, uh, and the, the, the great roads that the Romans built. Uh, again, the time of the Reformation was a, was a, it was a ripe fruit. Uh, the Lord had created uh, the, the right conditions uh, for the spread of the gospel and the spread of the Holy Scriptures so that uh, down to the, the common plowman could have his own scriptures and, and read the Bible if, if, he, if he were literate. Literacy uh, was, uh, was expanding as well. Um, the remarkable characteristic of the reformers was the basic agreement on important doctrines. Uh, now the tenet upon which all reformers did agree was justification by faith alone. In other words, not, it's not, you're, you're not right with God, which is what justification means, uh, because of something you do. Uh, it's your faith in Christ. In fact, the Scripture says the faith of Christ is what saves us. They believe that salvation is not obtained by works, good deeds, not that they're not important, but they come after you're saved, not before. Uh, but it's not obtained by fasting, by giving money to the church, or doing penance, uh, etc. But salvation is God's free gift. This doctrine formed the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. And despite the claims of Rome that the church has recognized the authority of the Bishop of Rome since the beginning, and you've heard this many times, uh, history proves that that's simply not the case. Uh, some of the more prominent proto-reformers before the, you know, the Reformation doesn't, didn't begin with, with Luther nailing the 95 theses to the uh, door at Wittenberg. Uh, it, we, the, the, there were reformers long before that, uh, proto-reformers. Uh, uh, Luther lit the, lit the flames. He, he started the fire. Uh, but it was smoldering many, many years before that. Uh, we call them proto-reformers coming before the uh, actual Reformation. Uh, some of them include Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. Milan had a glorious history of, of being faithful to the Scriptures. Um, he served uh, from uh, in AD 374 to 397, that's Ambrose. Uh, uh, Rufinus, who was the first metropolitan in the Diocese of Milan in the 5th century, and his successors, again in Milan, uh, including Laurentius in the 6th century, uh, Mansuetus, who was another bishop of Milan, uh, and in the 8th century, Paulinus, uh, the bishop of uh, Aquileia, uh, Claudius, the archbishop of Turin in the 9th century, another proto-reformer who believed many of the things that the reformers uh, uh, taught uh, long before they came on the scene. As late as the year 1059, the clergy in Milan said to Damians, the papal legate, that their church, quote, according to the ancient institutions of the fathers, was always free without being subject to the Bishop of Rome. That was 1059. As late as that, they said, we're not subject to the Bishop of Rome. He's no pope over us. He's no, no higher than the bishops of, of Bishop of Milan. So the Reformation was a continuous, all-enveloping movement across many nations, transforming them by the gospel of God's grace. It was a glorious spiritual awakening. Well, we see the Reformation and it went back to the earliest, the, uh, the gospel of the earliest church and it really 
restored the faith of the early church. The early church itself went out from Jerusalem, we saw it went to many different parts of the world and we've traced some of that the glorious histories in Asia and Ireland and Belgium and in different parts of Europe. It went forth magnificently and it had started from Jerusalem going out across the world and it was the gospel of God's grace that changed the world that was floundering at the time of when Christ came into the world the Roman Empire had been established, universality had been established, there was the Pax Romana, peace of Rome and but there was an emptiness, people were dead in trespass and sins and the gospel changed the lives of men and women and magnificently so the city of Rome began for 250 years with a wonderful gospel as we know but we saw that the dregs came in in the 4th and 5th century the church had so declined in the city of Rome that it was just a substitution now for hierarchy and dead rituals and it became worse in the 5th century where a priest had been introduced to mediate and then it became worse as it was recognized by Justinian in the 6th century and then by later on in the 7th century by Phocas. It had more and more civil authority and then it just rose to an infamous place where we became the persecutor of the believers right across the world. So not only was the Church of Rome not the first church but it only came about in the 4th, 5th century with the utter decline from what had been Christianity and it has come into be not only apostate but persecuting the true believers. So this is the, the story of the early church and it needs to be heard that the gospel went forth and the gospel to free people from their sins. Men and women embraced the true gospel people of Africa, of Egypt, of Gaul, of Germany, of Ireland, of Britain, of India had their eyes open. the gospel of God's grace went forth. And this is the message that is preached and that is the same message that was preached by the early church is preached today in the gospel of God's grace. And there was a stark contrast between this, the church of Rome, and the paper church and I'd like you to comment on that please Bill. Well that that stark contrast Richard is certainly true uh, and I think this uh, video hopefully has made that very clear and I would encourage people to uh, replay this video and, and study what has been said and check it out uh, look at the scriptures look at uh, uh, commonly accepted uh, accurate history uh, because in stark contrast to the apostles and elders of the first church at Jerusalem the Pope of Rome with his hierarchy of cardinals and prelates, archbishops, bishops, priests, they proclaim their dogmas, uh, the, the teachings of the, of the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Church as infallible, and they proclaim their sacraments are the means of grace. Thus the papacy is contrary to the Bible because the Bible doesn't teach uh, that any man's word is infallible. Uh, uh, only God's word is infallible uh, and it's contrary to the authentic church of history the church of, of the Bible in fact the papal system with its idolatry uh, with its inquisition uh, with its claimed infallibility shows itself to be the woman uh, of the book of Revelation sitting upon the scarlet colored beast the same woman, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, is still today making merchandise of the saints and purporting to dialogue with true Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, that cannot be. Like true believers of old, we have to enter the battle. This is the, you don't hear this term much anymore. You used to hear it a lot. You read, read the old Christian books, old Puritan books. Uh, the church on earth was called the church militant. 
The church in heaven is called the church triumphant. But we're not in heaven. We're on earth. And we're part of the church militant. Uh, as, as the hymn says, onward Christian soldiers. Uh, we have to enter into battle. Uh, and there is a battle. Uh, Paul reminds us the battle is spiritual. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but we do wrestle against satanic powers. The Lord is with us. We will have the final victory. You know, I, I've, I've read the last book of the, of the Bible. It, uh, we, we do win. Uh, but the command of the Holy Spirit in the words of Scripture is still this. Having done all to stand. Stand therefore. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're promised that. Uh, we will batter them down with the word of God. Uh, the certainty, and we can be certain, uh, the scripture tells us we are to know that we have eternal life. Find that in the book of 1 John. To know that we have eternal life. The certainty that we know the Lord, and that we are his, uh, is, is a tremendous, tremendous uh, assurance of faith. And it should give us encouragement. Uh, it should give us a, a, a resolve uh, to enter into the battle and to know that we are on the Lord's side and victory will be ours. Richard? Yes, indeed, victory will be ours. And we rejoice that we know the early church and we know the joy it was. Those men and women who went to... to died for the faith with joy under the persecutions in the early church. Those who died in the Inquisition rejoicing that their salvation was in Christ and Christ alone. It is amazing how Bible believers have been true to that faith that went out from Jerusalem and went across the world. I had the privilege of being in China for a year, it was the year of Tiananmen Square, and it was amazing to see the believers there really being true to the scripture and to the faith that is in scripture. They were very conscious that they were in line with what had been the early church. It's amazing this China and the revival that has gone on in, in China for over 40 years since the time of Mao Zedong. It's amazing to see the spread of the true gospel in China and right across the world, people conscious of the gospel and what the early church was. And that's what we have tried and in this video presented to you, the authentic early church established by Christ on his own person, the gospel of grace. And we ask that before the all-holy God that you know that you're right before God, that you've turned to him by grace alone, through faith alone, and that you also can rejoice that he is your God in Christ Jesus, and that you can go forth and proclaim the gospel, and that you know your history and the history of the authentic early church, so that God is glorified in all things, and we truly praise him. All praise, glory, worship, and honor be to the Lord God Almighty, in and through Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. Amen.